Good morning, family. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 12. And we will continue in worship as we hear the Lord speak through His Word this morning. Romans chapter 12, I want to begin in verse 3 and then read down through the end of the chapter. Obviously, we won't talk about all that this morning, but I do want to share it. That's one thought. So if you found your place there, please join with me as I stand. And after I read, please remain standing and we will sing praises to God for His Word. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. Let me remind you, these are His words. These are not mine. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ or differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Hate or abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never Pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Before we get into this morning, um, let me say I love y'all. Studying through this, um, I came back around to the understanding that we belong to one another. We are family, and I was overwhelmed with that thought this week as I was studying that, and I was just so thankful for my family. I mean, y'all are truly my brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's not a theolo I mean, I realize that's a theological point, but it's way past theology with me. Uh, it's become reality for me, and I'm so thankful to be a part of you guys and your lives and your children, and, you know, Paige and I were singing, and, you know, I got sad. For a minute, there used to be three little heads sitting on the other side of mom. And uh, you guys have got little heads sitting on the next side of y'all. And it, it's not going to be long. It's not long. So I don't care if they cry and fuss. And I don't care if they come up here while I'm preaching. Just enjoy it. Um, they won't very long. Right, my dear? <laughs> they won't very long. 
but it's, it's a joy. It's a joy for my wife and I to get to share life with you guys and just to be a part of your family. It's, this is such a wonderful place. And you really kind of get an idea of that, like I said, when you turn to Romans 12, because we've really turned the corner on this thing. I mean, I don't know how many weeks. I know from the sermon title that 49 sermons, we've been gawking and gazing at the glory of God and all that He's done on our behalf. But what I read this morning, that was a really long list of things you're going to do now. And so we've really turned the corner into your responsibility as a child of God to act, to do, to say, to believe, to be, all these wonderful things. So you would think, hopefully, the sermons are going to get simpler uh, for me in preparation, but also it should get easier for you because the gawking and the glory, all that is past a little. I'll carry you back there from time to time when we go... I don't know how in the world I'm going to do that. You want me to feed my enemy? Well, I'll remind you of Jesus in those moments when it's really hard. But yeah, he really means that. He really means those words. And so we started in, in Romans chapter 1 with this understanding that in response to the gospel, you've got a sacrifice to make. And I wish we understood that better. Can you imagine the Jews coming to worship, you know, every Saturday with that lamb tucked up under their arm or that some sort of bird or some sort of animal that they were going to offer to God? I mean, they, they fully understood the sacrifices. It was, you know, a precious offering, either that they had raised or, or purchased for money. It was one that you'd want to keep. They got into the habit of bringing the junk the stuff that they looked out in their pasture and they go, well, I don't want that. Grab it for Sunday and we'll take it down there and have it slain. No, the faithful ones would look out there and go, what have I got? Where, where's the best thing I've got? And you'd see that little lamb that was about a year old, just as white as snow. And you'd go out there with tears rolling down your face going, man, this is a costly sacrifice. But I'm going to give it for the glory of God. They understood the sacrifice. So when we turn into Romans 12 and we hear those words to offer this sacrifice and we, we're reminded that there is no more altar that we're supposed to come to and the call for the sacrifice is for your life, you need to be wise enough to realize he's calling for the most expensive thing that you have to give. The thing that you're going to be most reluctant to give, you'd like to give all kinds of things. I mean, you'd like to be able to go through your house and pick just something out. I mean, we're getting close to Christmas, and you've got to buy presents for in-laws, right? And so you don't want to spend that much money, so you go through the house and you re-gift something, right? Surely y'all don't do that. But that's not what the Lord's calling for. He's calling for your life. It's the most precious thing that you own. The one thing you don't want to give is the very thing He wants you to give. And so we ask you to make that sacrifice of your life to Him. Now, as I told you, as wonderful of a metaphor and an illustration that is, and it does need to grab you around the throat a little bit, Paul's not going to leave you there. Let's get out of the illustration and get to the practical, concrete action. And he goes on to say, in order to do that, you need to stop something. And because he tells us to stop, that implies that we're doing it. And the one thing that he knows that we're doing is we are being molded and shaped by this world. You're thinking like the world, you're acting like the world, you're talking like the world, and you're doing like the world. And Paul says, you, you got to stop. All that's got to be in the past and put down and put away. Because that sacrifice you bring has got to be worth something. And he doesn't want anything from the world. He wants you and he wants you to come out of that world spiritually and he wants you to start being transformed into the image of the glory of Christ. And the more like Christ you become, the more precious that sacrifice is, right? Of course, the more we understand that sacrifice. And you're like, well, how in the world am I supposed to be transformed into the image of Christ? How am I supposed to do that? Well, it begins right here in your mind. Because until your mind is changed, how you live will never change. And that's the problem with so many of our habits and addictions and 
all that stuff that we do, we try to go through programs and we try to memorize steps and all that silliness. That doesn't work. But let me tell you something. When God changes your mind about something, your life will change. Is that right, Chris? That's exactly right. Is that right, Brother Ted? When God changes your mind about what you think, about what you're doing, you'll stop what you're doing. And that needs to be a prayer that rolls out of your mouth very often. God, I know, obviously, I love this because I catch myself doing it all the time. I know it's wrong, but yet here I am again. I find it in my hands. I want you to make me hate this thing to where it just makes me throw up physically so I'll see it in a different light, not as a pleasure, not as a desire, but as something that just makes me sick to my stomach. Now, you all all know there's sins out there that you don't participate in that make you sick to your stomach. There's no need me mentioning them. You just think about them for just a second. There's things that make you sick to your stomach, and you go, how in the world could anybody ever, you know? You know how we do. Well, how could, in the world could anybody ever do what you do? As a child of God. You see, you've got to have your mind radically changed. It's not a natural thing. That's why the scriptures say you must be born again. Because what you have to work with is not fit to work with. And so you've got to be born again. And you've got to pursue that mind of Christ. Now once you get there, we're there. Because now all of a sudden you discern the will of God. And y'all, that's the top of the mountain. Remember what Jesus said in Hebrews 10, I have come to do your will, O God. And so that's the very thing the Son of God, when He comes, involves Himself with totally. That it was all He was about. The will of God. And so you and I have to hear the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Now everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father. And so it needs to be a passionate concern of ours to do the will of God. But in order to even figure it out and even be able to discern the will of God, your mind's got to be radically changed. And that takes place through constantly being exposed to the teaching of the Word of God. You say, okay, I, I hear all of that. But I still want to know how that's going to work tomorrow. And that's what I read to you this morning. How that's going to work tomorrow is by how that changes your relationship with everybody else on this planet, believers and unbelievers alike. When your mind becomes transformed to the way that God thinks, the way that you treat people is going to change. Now, if you want the example, you can just simply look at the Lord Jesus Christ and how He treated people. See Him going up the hill carrying the cross. If you want the ultimate picture of how our God treated others. He didn't mind being cursed. He didn't mind being accused. He didn't mind the shame. It was his joy, Hebrews 12, as he climbed Mount Calvary with a cross on his back and hung on that cross in our place and died. That's how he related to other people, you see. And so we've got that glorious example before us, but we don't even have to, I mean, we can just look there. If that ever gets a hold of your heart, I won't even have to preach Romans 12. But Paul says, I'll break it down very specifically and very practically for you. And he begins by how we relate to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at verse 10 of Romans 12. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. In other words, how you're going to treat one another in this church is described very frankly in those words right there. Be absolutely devoted to one another. 
Now, I've watched parents with kids that have gotten sideways. Now, thankfully, I have not experienced that. And by the grace of God, I never will, but I know parents who have. And I've watched them be absolutely devoted to those kids. And sometimes you scratch your head. And you say, I don't know why in the world I keep going with this kid, but I just keep going and going and going and going and going. And praise God for you who've done that as an example for us. But let me tell you something. That's exactly how we're supposed to treat one another. It doesn't really matter what happens. It doesn't really matter the offense because we're a part of the same body. They're family and I'm going to keep going and going and going and hoping and hoping and hoping. They're going to turn the corner one day. I'm absolutely devoted to them. And I will not stop until the Lord calls me home. Can, you, can, can we do that? I think we can. I don't think I'm being naive. I think that's the type of family that we have here. And so when you get sideways with one another in the context of this body, remember the words of our Lord. Because of what He has done for us in the gospel, the way that we offer ourselves as a sacrifice, the way that we walk in the will of God and have our minds transformed is when we turn away from our hurt feelings and we remind ourselves that I'm absolutely devoted to these people. Come what may, I'm devoted to them. So that's how we relate to one another. If you want to offer your life as a sacrifice, if you want to get in line with the will of God, that's how you respond to one another. But it's not just how you and I relate to one another. It's how we relate to the world. Look down, if you will, in verse 18. Let me just grab everybody that's out in the world and, and read verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with who? All men. In other words, if again, the sacrifice, if you want to make that thing, consistently, faithfully with the teaching of God's Word and His command here, if you want to get in line with the will of God, you will knock every wall down that you can find, even the ones you've built yourself. You'll burn it all down in order for you to be at peace with everybody. Now it says possible. And I don't need to go on with that because we know there are certain situations where it's just not possible but let me tell you something, that's a long way down the road. That's not the first turn. That's after you've gone through about a hundred turns and you're just like, it's just not possible. We're way too quick to get to that statement. Because this statement is so far further than we even realize that God says, hey, you want to, you want to get in line with my will, you're, you're going to strive. Well, Joey, what about my family? You're going to strive. What if they won't even speak? You're going to strive. What if they've done... You're going to strive to the glory of God. You're going to strive to be at peace with all men. But there's a third category in here. And this one, I'm telling you, is really tough. Verse 20 this is the category of those who absolutely despise the ground you walk on. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And you're like, well, that's not even possible. I know it's not, but if you've had a transformed mind and you've laid hold of the will of God, that's not possible, that's probable. And you're like, how? Think about Jesus. What did He say from the cross? Father, forgive them. And I'm like, what a statement. You do realize that He held creation in His hand in that very moment. 
those that were mocking him, he held their heart in his hand. And at any moment, he could have taken the breath from their very chest and watched them drop. And I would believe that most of us would have done that, hanging there on Calvary, having that power to take the breath from a man's chest. And he's up there cursing you, spitting upon you, having beaten you, and all you got to do is look away and they drop dead. Can you imagine that power? But can you imagine the humility of our Savior looking upon them and saying, Father, forgive them? That's why he can say, if your enemy is hungry, take him out to eat, man. Buy him what he wants. And if he's thirsty, get up out of your chair, run down the hall to the kitchen, get him something to drink and give it to him. Bless, he says, Bless those who persecute you. Tough business. But that's all the business that we're going to be walking through uh, in the next few weeks. But that's the practical outworkings of what it means to discern the will of God, walk in the will of God, and offer your life as a living sacrifice. But I want you to know the thing that shocked me the most is the playing field of where this primarily takes place. I got it wrong, just frankly, to be honest with you. Look with me at verse, back to Romans 12. Look with me at verse 4. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function... So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That is the very first place Paul goes. He doesn't go to the what. He goes to the where. He goes right into the context of the local church, right into the context of the family of faith. He says, offer your life as a sacrifice. Have your minds transformed. Discern the will of God and walk in it. And you're like, what's that look like? And he's like, don't ask what yet. You're not ready for what. I want you to ask where. Where do you learn the will of God? Where do you have your mind transformed? Where do you offer that sacrifice? And he says, right here. This is where it all starts. You keep a finger there. And because I, I began to argue, I'm like, oh, that's just Romans. That's not consistent. Go with me to the right to the book of Ephesians. In fact, we're going to steal a lot of things from Ephesians this morning. But go with me to Ephesians 4. This is a really good time to just pause. I'll let Rob come up here and teach you through Ephesians 4. I mean, he goes into so much detail with Ephesians 4. Now, I want you to notice he's turned the corner on the gospel. It just takes him a couple of chapters to get through the gospel in Ephesians, not 11, like in Romans, but you still get the same result. Therefore, now watch where he goes. I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility, gentleness, patience, showing tolerance for one another in love being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called, with one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 11, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the what? body of Christ. In other words, if Pearson was going to play basketball today, God says, come on down to the basketball court. We're going to work this thing out there. Or if you're going to play volleyball later today, he says, come on down to the volleyball court. Or if you're going to play football Friday night, he says, come on down to the field and we're going to work this thing out in your life. I'm going to help you walk through this time in your life where your mind is transformed, where you begin to discern and lay hold of the will of God, and all that takes place on the court and in the context of this church. I immediately had to pause and repent. 
because I don't think enough of the local body. And you're like, how can you do that? You're the pastor. I'm, I'm telling you, none of us think enough of the importance of what we're doing now as we've gathered together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship our Lord and Savior. It takes place in this context. In other words, I wonder how often Pearson would get to play if he never showed his face down at the court. How often would you get to play on Friday night if you were never found on the football field Monday through Saturday? At what point is your life going to begin to look like a football player? And it's the same for being a Christian and doing these things that we find in Romans 12. At what point are you going to be able to feed your enemy? Well, let me tell you, never unless you find yourself faithfully in the context of the local church. Let me keep on going in Ephesians. I, t- I told you there was so much that he did. But notice with me, because we're going, to get to, we're going to get to gifts, but I want you to see the maturity first. Let me begin in verse 11. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Notice, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to... Grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. Notice verse 16, and I'm I'm done with this thought. From whom, Christ, the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now, how can you do that if you're not here? Let me tell you, you don't. And so the guy who says, oh, I can worship on my back porch. Well, you might, but you'll always wear diapers and have a pasty in your mouth when it comes to you being like Jesus. And the guy who says, oh, I can go every now and then. Yeah, you sure can. But you'll never look like Jesus. You'll never be able to offer the sacrifice that He wants. You'll never have a transformed mind. And as far as the will of God goes, that's out the door. That's not even going to be made available to you because God has designed that you begin to experience that, understand that, and walk walk that in this context. And that's why I had to stop and talk with the Lord because I've underestimated, as much as I estimated, I've underestimated the importance of us being together. Now, not only have I underestimated the importance of it, but let me tell you something else we've underestimated. You've underestimated the importance of you in this process. Because God has designed it in a way that it requires every single one of us working together using the gifts that He has given us in order that we as a whole might grow up. So if you're not functioning in that sense, you're not helping the body mature. It's not just about coming. I mean, I'll take it. But that's not what He's talking about. He's talking about you being such an active part within the body, using your gifts that I'll talk about in just a minute, in context of the body, so the rest of us can look like Christ, you included. Now, I didn't design it. I don't fully understand it. But that's what the text says. And as much as I love seeing your faces, man, you would not believe what all God wants in you and through you and from you and for you in the context of this body. It's crazy what He's gifted you to do, and what He allows you to do. Keep catching 
Kim's eyes, you did well, young lady. She came in and she got connected. I, I don't know, have you ever been through a teaching on spiritual gifts? Yeah, never. That's okay. I'll explain to you what you're already doing. And then you get other families that come in that you can't catch them before they get out the door. And I get frustrated because I'm thinking they won't be here long. Won't be here long unless something turns. Won't be here long unless something turns. Won't be here long. They're gone. And I'm like, ah. I missed it. Because they didn't understand the importance of being a part of a place like this and growing in their relationship with God and becoming like Christ. Man, I had a wonderful conversation with a husband Wednesday night. So thankful for what the Lord's doing in his life. So thankful that he's beginning to understand some things. So thankful that he sees the importance of this place. And so thankful that he wants to be a part of this place. I'm like, he gets it. And you begin to understand that that getting it is just a part of God's amazing grace. But y'all, again, this is just how God's designed this thing. And Paul's going to go on to use the illustration of the body, which is the most genius illustration of all times. Most commentators think it just came straight from the Apostle Paul. It's like in a number of his letters. But that's the best way for you to understand this thing. If you don't think it's important to be a part of the local church and allow the Spirit of God to grow you in the knowledge of God and the character of God, then cut your foot off. See how that goes for you. Will it affect your whole body? Terribly so. Do you affect us when you don't come in here and understand the importance of being a part, an active part of this body? You, are you going to affect us? You don't understand how much you're going to affect us. You know, we always pray, and I hear it from a number of my men, God, thank you so much for having brought us together or having designed this body. I hope that's more than just a prayer. I hope you all have taken a hold of that truth and understand. Eddie and Jesse just came in. I don't know exactly why, but I know it's sovereignty. I've seen them already go to work and do so much in the way of encouraging me and my wife. I'm just excited that God's doing something new in our midst. I'm just excited that he gave a new gift to the body when they walked through the door. It's not for me about filling any kind of pews. It's for me about us seeing our body grow and mature in Christ and becoming more Christ-like. And in order for that to happen, it takes everybody in the building. Again, an analogy from the body. You can work out all you want, right? But if you're going to go to McDonald's every day, you see, there's a breakdown, and when there's a breakdown, it affects everything. And frankly, if y'all get mad and leave next week, you're going to affect all of us, terribly so. How's that pressure for staying? Let me give you one that you could see even more profoundly. Sarah gets mad and leaves next week. Is that going to affect this church? You better believe it will. Miss Burma, leave us. You think that's going to affect this church? You better believe it will. But you also need to realize Pearson leaves this church. This is going to affect us. You better believe it will. Zeke leaves this church. You think it's going to affect us? You better believe it will. I didn't put it together. God put it together. He designed it in such a way. And we need every single one that God has brought into this body in order for us to mature and grow in Christ. And if I didn't mention your name, it's just for the sake of time because there is no name, there is no face that we don't need. In fr and frankly, there is no name and there is no face that God hasn't equipped to function in that role. It takes the whole body to grow. It takes the whole body to mature. We, let's look at the text. Look what he says back in Romans 12. 
look what he says at the end of verse 5. We are individual, individually members of one another. We belong to each other. Period. And since we do, it takes every one of us to grow and mature like we're supposed to do. Every one of us. Now, before we get into spiritual gifts, I need to tell you that if you haven't been in church very long, you're at a, you're at a tremendous advantage. Because there was poor teaching that went on about spiritual gifts for a very long time. In fact, the whole time that I was coming up, you went to Lifeway, you bought the spiritual gift test packet and devotional material, you took it to the church, you read those passages, it was a spiritual gift list. Then you took the test, which was nothing more than a personality test, and you checked the box and somebody said, this is a spiritual gift test that you have, or a spiritual gift that you have. That could not be further from the truth. Because God doesn't do things like that in a box. And the problem is, and all these thoughts are flooding to my mind, and I just want to vomit all these words all over you. I've got to back up and reel myself in. God guides us through three means. The first means is that book in your lap. God guides us through His Word. That's painfully obvious. You know the second way that God guides us? Through the giftings of His people. In other words, y'all are absolutely unique. So what God is going to do through us is absolutely unique. So why in the world would I pull out a list, stuff you in a box, and tell you what we're going to do? It doesn't work that way. You're unique. You serve a special purpose in the church. I need you to work, play that role in the church because it is a part of how God is leading the entire body. Think about it in this way, Chris. If you've got a basketball team with two six-foot-five guys with really wide hips, what kind of game are you going to play? Are you going to full court press and shoot threes all day? Or are you going to put them down on the blocks and just keep throwing them the ball? You see how this works? Or if you've got a bunch of guys that are, you know, five foot ten can shoot the lights out, and you've got about four of them, you're going to drop two of those guys on the blocks, Johnny, and just keep throwing them the ball? Or are you going to back them out across that nice little line that's painted around and just say, guys, just shoot the ball? You see, what we did was we came in with the game plan, we created the positions, and then we tried to force people into the positions. I need you to be point guard. You're like, I'll get him out of the ball, dude. And, and we did those sort of things in the church, and we got away from the special, unique, powerful, glorious, spiritual things that God was doing. And that's why it's so important that we begin to understand each other and, and what we can do, how God has created us, how we do function in the context of the body. So I gave you two. God guides us through His Word. God guides us through the unique, thing, unique giftings of Jeremy and, and, and Cody and Rob and Jesse and my wife. He guides us through that. But the last thing is He guides us through the unique circumstances and experiences that we find ourselves in. You just have to be patient and wait. And when you see the opportunity... As a church, we just lay hold of that opportunity and we assume something, which is most time dangerous, but we assume that God has gifted us to do what He's put in front of us to do. And we just step out there and we do it. We just simply take hold of it. Now what I'll do over the next few weeks, and I'm, I'm going to quit right there because I think we've gone far enough. But what I'll do over the next few weeks is talk about spiritual gifts and those sort of things. And again, I don't want you to set your eyes on the spiritual gifts because you know how you begin to discover this thing? You do what's in front of you to do. What's a spiritual gift to my wife? I have no idea. She does it all. Will you feed football players this week? Yeah. Hey, will you help me break down Psalms 48 this week? Yeah. Hey, will you make communion bread this week? Yeah. Hey, will you teach Sunday school? Yes. That's how you discover it. When you see that need and you're like, yeah, I got it. I don't know how. It's okay. Just get it. And you begin to figure these things out. I'll tell you how it went with me and I'll be done. Sometime, God changed my life and caused me to be born again. 
23 is when I, I'm pretty convinced that took place. These were my words. I will do whatever you want me to do. In fact, the first thing that walks through my door, I'll do. Now, I was at Broadway, just graduated college. Somebody called me on the phone just like a week after those words rolled out of my mouth and said, will you teach Sunday school? Now, here's the joke about that. I'd never been to Sunday school a day of my life, hadn't read the Bible. How scary is that? Y'all, it doesn't work like that around here. I'll just, I'll just tell you. Craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. But I didn't know that God was going to begin preparing me to do something that I would have never, never picked to do. I don't like, I didn't use the H word, I don't like talking. I came home one day this week and I said, Honey, I've been talked to all day long. Will you please turn off the TV, sit beside me, and don't say a word? She did for the longest. She said, I got three questions. Can I give them to you one at a time? I said, one, and let's take a break. I like quiet. And it's one of my favorite things. I can't stand racket and noise at the house. Second thing is, I don't like to be in front of people. I never have. Never. Don't like it. In fact, if you want to let me be me, I'm introverted. I'll have a conversation with one of you, but I'm not having a conversation with all of you. No, no thanks. Third thing is, I don't like teaching. I don't. I will not speak or teach about any other thing other than this book. I made that commitment many years ago because somebody asked me to speak or teach about something else. It liked to physically kill me, and I was like, I don't have to do this to myself. And so what happened was there was an opportunity put in front of me today, hey, or one day, hey, will you teach Sunday school? I'm like, oh, I made that commitment already. Yes. And I look at that 30 years later, and I go, you know, if I would took a spiritual gift test back then, this would have never popped up. It's not about that. It's about you being willing, being a living sacrifice. And when you see an opportunity, you go, I'll take it. I got it. And then you go home, fall on your face, and you go, I don't know how in the world I'm going to do this. But by the grace of God, I will do this. And you'll begin to see just how necessary you are for all of us around here. I'll leave you with the thought that I began with. I love you all. There has yet to be an eye that has fallen off of me in the whole time that I've been talking to you. Y'all are the most hungry people I have ever seen in my life. We are few, but we are faithful. And I can't wait for us, or I can't wait to see what God does in us as we lay hold of these truths in Romans chapter 12. And I can't wait to watch you grow up more like Jesus. I came back to that understanding as well this week because, y'all, it is kind of discouraging to look around and see the empty spaces, and I have to give myself a little pep talk every now and then and remind myself of what the Word says. We're supposed to make disciples. That's what we're supposed to do. And I think how much your lives have changed over the years, and I am so encouraged by that. It is what makes me get up here week in and week out because I see more of Christ in you and I'm excited about that. And I want us to do that until he comes or I go home because that is literally what it's all about. Let's pray.